I just woke up. I don't even know what time it is, but um, it's going to be a bit of a rough day for me. 13 years ago, I made the biggest mistake of my life. So, I am going to be 32 this year. Back when I was 14, my mom had uh, taken me and my sister and my cousin to a meeting at a church, like a, like a hangout for homeschoolers. Um, I was 14, my sister was nine, we were kids, and we were just skating, you know, on skates in the gymnasium. We were just having fun, and the entire time I was there, I was noticing the sky, and he kept looking at me, and I was like, what is, at first I was like, what is this guy doing, like, ew. And, um, we were, we were skating from one side of the gym, like, really, really fast, and they had these, like, mats stacked up, and we were, like, toppling over them, and it was just something fun, we were, we were having fun, we were playing a game, we were kids, and, um, he come in, and he sat down to keep watching me, and even my little sister, nine at that point, was like, Courtney, that, that man's watching you. And I was like, I know, like, it's weird. And uh, we were using a lot of energy, so at one point I sat down. And at that point, he was, like, about this far away from me. And he says, hi. And so I'm like, hi, you know, like, I'm trying to figure out what this guy's doing. And um, as we're talking, he's inching over closer and closer and closer and closer and closer until we are hip to fucking hip. And, uh, it turns out we had a lot of mutual friends in common, um, and those kids were Bible college students, so here I am, 14 years old, having college friends, um, so immediately I felt like, okay, this guy's okay, you know, he's in Bible college, what harm could he do? So, we get to talking and everything, and these are okay, I notice he's flirting, and I'm like, okay, and of course... To a 14-year-old who's never had that before, that's amazing. Like, all a 14-year-old girl wants is for that kind of attention, you know? And I wasn't ever getting it. Um, so, of course, I was, like, starting to feel it. I was like, yeah, okay, you know, I'm cute, what? Um, so we made plans to meet up at um, another, it was, like, a, a hol Halloween thing, and he didn't show. So then he made plans to come to my church's Christmas pageant, so he came, and that's where things started heating up. Um, there was some hand holding, there was, you know, long hugs and, and everything like this. And now I mentioned he was a college student. He was eight years older than I was. So yeah, ew, ew, bleh. Okay. So yeah, on and on, we're meeting up, our relationships progressing. I'm telling my mom and she's like, at the beginning she was like, okay with it. Cause like, like, I was okay with it, because I was like, mutual friends, Bible college student, you know, yada, 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 his intentions are good, like, he says he's gonna marry me, like, it's all well and dandy, and I wanted to be married right out of high school anyway, I wanted, I wanted to be a wife, I wanted to be a mother, you know, and I wanted it right out of school, so I was like, okay, everything's lining up, it's wonderful, hip, hip, hooray, you know, and, uh, eventually, my dad found out, and they put a stop on it. My mom said the relationship was just getting too serious for my age and everything. So, uh, the deal was he would wait for me until I turned 18. Well, it wasn't quite 18 because I was trying to, you know, when I started working at 16 and 17, I was saving up my money for the wedding because I was getting married at 18. Like, why wouldn't I save up? And I asked my grandparents for help with a wedding dress, and that's when my dad found out, and he was like, what the hell? And so he called the guy over and had a long talk with him, and then we were able to date, and it was uh, not long after that he proposed, and we really started the wedding planning and everything like that. I was working at a daycare three hours a day, not making much money at all. And I paid off for a wedding. He gave me like a few hundred bucks when he got his taxes in. That was it. The morning of the wedding, I was sitting in this little room. My parents had left. My friends had left. It was just me 
and one of my bridesmaids may have been there. I don't know if she was still in there yet or not. But I remember sitting there and the church we got married at was the church I grew up at. So it was like literally like a couple blocks away from where I was living. And I had this gut feeling to just hike up my dress and run home, lock all the doors, turn off all the lights and hide. And I didn't. On June 10th, 2006, I made the worst decision of my life. I got married. I was a virgin. I was 18, a virgin bride. I walked out of the bathroom and I had sex. And I remember being so excited because I was always such a horn dog and I always wanted to know what sex was like. And I always wanted to have sex. <clears throat> that part hasn't changed. And I remember afterwards laying there and I felt gypped and cheated. And I remember in my brain, he was sitting over there panting like he had just the greatest time of his life. And I just laid back and I was like, that can't be it. I, I waited all this time for the hat. No. Mm -mm. So, in my 18 year old little brain, I thought the more we had sex, maybe the better it would get. No. He seemed to always enjoy himself, and I was just faking it. You know? For four years, we had sex over 800 times. We went on our honeymoon to Florida, not even a full week, and had sex over 30 times. All unprotected because I made the decision that I wanted a family right away. So, thankfully, nothing happened with that. Um, I did have a miscarriage back in 2007. So a year later, I did have a miscarriage but it was really complicated because I didn't have insurance. And so I was saving up to go to the doctor. But from the time, like, as you know, I was, I was 18. I didn't know what was happening. Um, I didn't fully understand the changes your body would go through, you know? So once I finally caught on, I was like, huh, you know, and I was taking pregnancy tests and they were all coming out negative. And I was like, no, this ain't right. My belly was rounding. Like I was like, something is, in me and um I'll never forget it. I was I was dusting the dresser and I felt this like whoosh inside me and I went to the bathroom and there was blood and there was discharge and I was like oh my god oh my god and I just I flushed it right away because I was I was scared I didn't know anything it was like the next day or two or three later was when my doctor appointment was. And I was like, oh. so that was, that was heartbreaking, but it turned out to be for the better, really. Um, my grandparents gave me a car that had been my dad's and that was my very first car. And so he only wanted to work part time. And he didn't have a job, so he was doing these side gigs with his dad. Um, for at least three-fourths of the time that we lived together in those four years, technically his mom was paying our bills because his dad wasn't even bringing in money on a regular basis. And she was about to be a retired teacher, but she was paying our bills because her son didn't want to work. I had a part-time job at Dollar Tree. Well... In order for him to go work with his dad, he would take my car to drive to his parents' house to go out with his dad, leaving me to have to walk a mile from our house to Dollar Tree in the snow both ways. So I'd have to walk a mile there, work, and then walk a mile back. And I'm like, this isn't right. Like, why would you do this to somebody? Like, you know, if I, got, if I can get a ride, you know, and David needs to use our car if we were down in one car, you bet your ass... I would be calling, like, a taxi or a friend or getting the person I'm going with to pick me up. Like, I would not let him walk in the snow if I didn't have to. 
that that's not love that's not love the first sign of something being wrong to me was on our honeymoon he was very religious and he wanted to go to a church on our honeymoon which I was fine with at the time because I grew up going to church and everything um but we had had sex so much that I ended up getting um, getting an infection. And I didn't know it was an infection because I had never had sex before. You know, I, I didn't know. The only thing I knew was like when you get pregnant, you pee a lot. And I was having to pee a lot and it was burning. And I just thought, oh, I'm pregnant. All right. You know, like that's how little I was that I didn't even know. We had had sex already so much, and uh, in the middle of like trying again, I just couldn't. I was, I was hurting so bad, and of course I wasn't ready, you know, down there. And he was started yelling at me. And he like. through my legs. Like I was just a piece of trash. And I remember I was so far from my family. I was scared because I didn't know what was going on down there. Like there was so many things. And then to feel like that on your honeymoon. I just I just remember I had to get away. So I grabbed my pajamas and I went to take the shower and I locked the door. And after a few minutes, like I just, I just, I just stood there crying and shaking because I, I didn't know what to do. the shower I could hear him sticking something in the door to unlock the door and I just remember is he coming to hurt me is this it of course you know I'm in the shower I'm still naked at this point you know like, like I, I was literally the most vulnerable I could be and he comes in and he just gets in the shower. He doesn't even ask. He just gets in. And he presses up against me. And he's like trying to hug me. And he's like apologizing. And I just remember. Being so scared. And so hurt. <laughs> like. My new husband on our honeymoon. Just treated me like. Like I was just like. Some whore. You know just a piece of trash. Just laying there for his blood didn't even, you know, acknowledge the fact that I was hurting or anything like that. Like, that should have been probably warning sign number two million. But here's the thing. We met when I was 14, you know, and like I said, the 14 year old girls, they want that attention. They... They want to be liked by a boy and desired by a boy. That's just natural. And, you know, I was getting that from a guy who was, we shared friends, who was promising me marriage, who seemed like he was going to be the one. And on paper, with the way I grew up, him wanting to be a preacher and all this other stuff, it seemed good on paper. And everybody told me, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. But I didn't listen because I was 14. You don't listen when you're 14. You don't listen when you're 18, you know? And I wish with all my heart that I could, as myself now, go back in time and just grab that girl on her wedding day and say, run. Listen to your gut and run. So many bad comments from my dad. 
and not enough validation. I was, I wasn't ever told that I was beautiful. My grandma told me I had a pretty face and of course that meant the rest of you was ugly. So when somebody comes along and says, oh, you're the bee's knees, you know, obviously you're going to run to that. And I just wish I could go back and tell her, you know, you're worth so much more. You don't have to do this. There's somebody out there that will really love you. Like, this is not the time to live this lifestyle. Who knows if I would have even listened to my own self back then, but I know that like, going into things I was scared and I felt like, you know, this could go one of two ways and I just don't know. And unfortunately, it went the wrong way. So basically, I married a predator. I mean, this guy preyed on a young kid barely a teenager and promising me the moon and stars, you know, and even as a 32 year old almost, I think about me trying to date a guy in his like early mid twenties and I'm like, ew, ew, go away from me, baby. Get, you know, like I, I can't imagine, I can't imagine that. Like it's fine if that's like the kind of relationship you're in and it works for you. Like it's all well and dandy, but Especially at those young ages. I mean, I feel like at 26, 27 is when your brain's fully developed and you're, you're just then hitting adulthood, you know? And that's where he was at. And I was over here, barely getting my foot out into the real world, you know? Thinking I was pregnant when I had a freaking, like, urinary tract infection. You know, like, <laughs> hello. I didn't know anything Like I said, I always, right after high school, wanted to get married and to start a family. And that's been my number one goal all these years since I was like 10 and I knew better. You know, that's all I ever wanted. Finally got everything I want and I'm so happy. And it's worked out with me and David like great. Um, but this time not so much. Um... I was a fantasy for him, I think. I think with his ideals and the ego he had going, I, I feel like he was trying to take a young girl, mold her into what he wanted, both as a man and religious and preacher's wife, kind of. Um, he was trying to, to make me what he just wanted and desired and instead of letting me be my own person you know and I didn't even know who my own person was you know I was still trying to figure that out too and um there is video proof somewhere I'll see if I find it where he actually says like that I was the best wife I was I was good you know and I know I was because when I get married like I'm gonna be committed to you I'm gonna give you my everything I don't go around looking, you know. Of course, at this time, okay, <laughs> there is an exception to the rule. Um, but things got really bad as far as abuse with me and him. Uh, two or three years into our marriage, I did seek out an old internet flame from Pakistan. And I would go down to the corner grocery or corner gas station and call him. And, you know, he was the only one I could reach out to for real love and comfort at that point. Um, because I wasn't getting it at home. I was scared at home. And I knew that if I could just hear this person say you're pretty or I love you or I want you. It made me feel better as a young woman, if that makes any sense. Um, so there, there was that. Um, towards the end of our marriage... I was sleeping on the couch and with the, we had uh, like French double doors uh, with mirrors on them that 
you, when you when you pushed open, you walked into our bedroom. So I would close those every night and sleep on the living room couch. That way, if he was coming out to get a drink or something, I could hear him coming out, and I knew to be on guard if he was going to try to hurt me. Um, I didn't want to be anywhere near him. Um, and this, of course, is after the whole abuse stuff happened, which I'm not going to get into. Um, that was just terrifying. Like, I just... I don't even want to think about that today. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's video proof of him saying I'm a good wife. And he's also talking about how I was just playing a role. And that's not the case. I wasn't playing a role. I was living that role, buddy. That was my life at that point, was to be your wife and do what I was doing. Um, what happened was I just wasn't the right person for him nor him for me and so we weren't playing a role we were in a relationship neither of us should have been in uh, and he should have known better he was old enough to say you're a child go home go get your teddy bear and go home <laughs> no I was a good wife I I know that I was a good wife and even now I continuously hound David I'm like am I okay like you know Am I being good to you? Do you need anything else? Just because I, I need that validation that what I'm doing is, is right and good. Because I don't want to, I don't want to fuck anything up. You know, like, sometimes, and this isn't, this isn't on David, because David's not any kind of bad. But, uh, sometimes I get scared. Because he's, like, he's so much bigger and taller than I am. And I, I hate this. I hate that my brain goes to this now. I think about how easy it would be for him to just like smack me or hurt me because he's like so much taller and stuff. And for the longest time, I stayed away from big guys and tall guys. And that's like my like ooh la la thing is like big tall guys with beers. I stayed away from that because I was afraid that if they got mad they would hurt me because of this one asshole. So I wasn't living a role. I was living my life. But I was just a fantasy for him. I was a toy, an object that he could mold himself, that he attempted to mold himself, and it didn't work out. Still, and pretty often, I have dreams of what I said about how I wish I could go back, and I was sitting there thinking I should just hack up my dress and run, and I have those dreams all the time of like, what if I actually did that, where I can feel in my dream, I can feel grabbing the satin and crinoline of my dress and bunching it up around my knees. I can feel my heels clinking against the concrete and running and the wind blowing in my face. I can feel locking the doors and switching off the lights. And I can hear him pounding on the door and the windows. And I just, whenever I wake up, I just, I have this, like, tightness and tingling in my chest, like, ugh, you know. And it took a long time to be able to say, I don't have regrets. It's not a regret, because I learned things with him. I learned what I truly wanted and needed out of a relationship, but I just ignored it for a long time because I was looking for that validation of love from somebody, you know, and I know that I shouldn't, I know that I should be enough and yada, 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 but at the end of the day, you do want somebody to love you, you do want somebody to say, oh, you're beautiful, I love you, you know, come here, let me hug and kiss you, you know, that's just natural. Um, and with Aziz, I grew up you know, with Aziz, I felt like that's when I finally hit my adulthood. And I learned who I was. And, you know, I got to see another way of life in Connecticut. 
Um, but I just, I just realized, I just wish that I could have got the validation I needed from my family. You know, they kept telling me, don't do this, this guy's not right, you know, yada, yada, yada. But what I needed to hear wasn't about him. It was about me. I needed to know that I was enough. I needed to know that I was beautiful. I needed to know that I had potential. I needed to know that it was okay to follow the dreams that I had. I needed to know that I was a child and that I didn't, I didn't know any better. I needed to know that a urinary tract is different from what it feels like to be pregnant. You know, like there are so many things I needed to know. And there were so many things I needed to hear that I didn't because I feel like my mom was, and no offense to her, but she was dealing with her own issues in her own life. And my dad was always verbally abusive and emotionally abusive. And the rest of my family, they were just trying to get by. And when they weren't trying to get by, they were overly religious. And so nobody had the time to, to make sure everybody was emotionally okay. And that's what I don't want for Eli. I want to always be there for him and to make sure, like, he knows I have his back. And if something's wrong, I'm going to be like, look, babe, I don't think this is the way you should go. Here's why. Can we try something else instead? Something like that. I don't know. But. I don't want him making the mistakes I did. And naturally as a parent, I know that you just, you say that, but I'm going to have open conversations with him and I'm going to tell him, look, this is what I did. This is what happened. And I wish I could have done it better or different, whatever the case is. I wish that my family helped me with my low self-esteem. I wish that they had told me I don't need validation from a man. And I wish that, um, I wish that instead of making the focus all about him and how bad he was and how wrong he was and how he had the problems, that there would be one person that could have just come out and said, you know what, Courtney, you're too pretty for him. You're too good for him. You have the opportunity to have so much going for you, just take that and run. Literally, take that and run. So if there's anybody watching, please don't make the mistake I did. Don't go into a marriage looking for validation from a person. Don't look for validation from a person, period. And listen to your gut. If, if, if you don't hear anything else from this video, Listen to your gut. Your gut's going to tell you, regardless of the situation or what's happening or whatever, your gut is going to tell you what's right for you. So I wish I listened to my gut. I wish I picked up that dress and ran out those doors and found the tiniest hole to crawl into and hide so nobody could ever find me. But, yeah. Don't make the mistakes I did. Uh, I wish I, uh went into Bible college, and then I went and got my master's degree in theology. I went through and I did that, and basically, um, I became a youth minister, and not long after that, I got my master's degree, and I got married, and um, my first relationship, I mean, you know, mostly I fell head, head over heels, and everything was great, and she was just everything that I could ever want, and stuff like that. And it just seemed like everything was perfect. And um, basically, that was probably something if I was a little bit older, <laughs> I could have, like, you know, figured out, oh, hold on, that, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, basically, it was kind of something where in her age, she was a lot younger than me. And she basically um, kind of wanted to play the role of, you know, that one, it'd be perfect for me and stuff like that. So... Basically, you know, after a couple of years of marriage, you start to kind of, you know, see the real side of somebody. And um, um, there's a lot of stuff that went on. Essentially, uh, she divorced me and converted to Islam. Oh, wow. Oh, no. Yeah. And um, I was the one who had evangelized her. I had um, 
you know, helped her, and she made the decision, and then, you know, uh, went to a church, and got baptized and everything. So that event was more traumatic for me than the divorce itself. Yes. Even though that was something, you know, like, we're taught for more. We're really young, you got to wait for marriage, and it's going to be good if you wait for marriage, and you do everything right, and all this kind of stuff. So uh, that was also very traumatic as well, because, you know, like, oh, well, I lost that, and also, you know, you're getting a minister and stuff like that. I mean, there are people, there's even members of my family that were like, you know, well, I guess you can't be a minister no more. So, 